Well, I want to uh, change gears and talk to you guys about a topic that um, confuses me. So I'm like really excited to get your feedback. So um, there was a, uh, this video is from this guy. I don't know who he is. It's, it's a little clip from Entrepreneurs in Cars. The title is called Why Women Don't Support Husbands in Difficult Times. And I was like, what? So I watched this video and he said something here that I was like, um, really struck me. And I wanted to get your guys' take on. I actually have never thought about this before. Um, and uh, and so there's a couple of ways I'm going to approach this topic. But it, it starts off while he's re he's reading a account of a woman who's basically uh, saying, my boyfriend like lost a job a couple of months ago and he's depressed and I'm working and I come home every night to be with him. And, and I find my, and he wants me to comfort him. He wants me to feel bad for him. And I just don't care. And I'm now, I'm losing my attraction for him. How do I get this attraction back? Okay. And this guy's response was amazing. So I wanted to get uh, your take on this because I think this is really important. Support the man I love. I have tried talking to him about him taking up all my time. But then he just asks, why don't you want to spend time with me? And that is why I don't understand why I don't want to be supportive. Well, we're going to have a conversation about female solipsism today. In today's show, we're going to conversate about female solipsism. All right, well, look, let's get... I don't like that framing. Solipsism means selfishness. I think this is much deeper uh, than that. But here we go. On the road. So I realize this might sound a little bit repetitive to some of the folks that have been watching me for some time now, but there's a quote that I've said many times that has been used by others out there. It is, women do not care about your struggles. They hang out at the finish line and they pick the winner. That is an innate baseline nature of female survival techniques. Okay, so his quote there is, women don't care about your struggles. They hang out at the finish line and pick the winners. Okay. Look, if we go back thousands and thousands of years, if women in a tribe of the old hunter-gatherer sort of days was not being looked after by her man, the father of her kids, uh, the person that she had pair bonded to and made it with, you know, let's say, maybe she's got kids with her, maybe she doesn't. I don't know about this lady's scenario. It doesn't sound like there are kids. But if a woman made a poor mate choice, it would often spell certain death for women back in those days. Now, not much has changed since then. Sure, a few thousand years have passed. Women can now have jobs. We all drive in cars. We have computers. We all pay taxes. Women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle, as the feminists like to say. A lot of strong, independent women out there today that aren't in the need of the care or the love or the protection of a man these days. So... That being said, you have to understand, like, from a baseline perspective, women just need men to get it. They need men to be competent. They need men to be able to solve problems. The biggest problem men need to solve is their own financial and providing and provisioning problems. And this guy, as she stated in her post early on, is unemployed again. Now, when you get to my stage of life and you end up talking to enough of the gals out there that have either been divorced, going through a divorce, um, or maybe their second or third one, if you know what I'm saying, one of the things you'll often hear them say is, well, I had to untie the knot because he was a loser. One of the big complaints you'll hear women make often is he couldn't keep a job down. Women don't have any patience for men that are unable to provide for the family. Now, the flip side of the coin is, Okay. <laughs> so basically what he's saying there is there's an innate element within, within women that is attracted to competence. I think that's the, the, the kinder way to say it. And so, um, and, and when, when a, when a, when a, um, couple starts to, when a woman starts to fall in love with a man, oftentimes what she's sensing is, I think, I think, I think he's going places. I, I think I can hitch, you know, there's something I see in him. There's some potential. And especially if you're planning on having a family, you know, and there's all kinds of this weird research going on now that when women are on hormonal birth control, it tamps down some of the, this level of attractiveness and they, they, they become attracted to men that are more feminine. But as soon as she goes off hormonal birth control and she's a normal woman who is going to have children and wants a husband that can provide for a family, then all of that DNA or <laughs> all of those hormonal 
uh, elements of attractiveness that are innate to women um, become kind of come online. And this is where a lot of divorce occurs. Um, this interesting theory that um, I, I think is a lot more and more people are talking about. Um, so, so, so I think the idea of, of attraction now, I think that th there's one other thing I want to throw into the mix here um, that is uh, really relevant to, um, to this topic. This is a, um, this is a tweet from, from Dean Abbott. Um, he wrote this, um, part of what women find attractive in a man is his potential to create a safe, secure, meaningful life for her. Because women are always gambling on men, their attraction to any particular man wanes and waxes based on their, per their perception of his competence to create the life she needs. Bitter men describe this as loving opportunistically, or what this guy said, solipsism, selfishness, basically. But it's really not, is what Dean Abbott says. It's just part of how female attraction mechanism works. Now, I'm bringing this up, and most people who are talking or who are tuning into this are, um, you're, you guys are mostly fathers and in marriages. So why talk about this now? Well, the reason is I'm having conversations with a lot of dads, and I just had one recently, where they're, they're noticing that as they struggle, their wife, uh, they, they expect support from their wife. They expect to be able to be comforted. But if they're showing a lack of competence and a lack of problem solving skills, especially systemically, then what I'm hearing increasingly from, from men is, is she is, she's losing patience with me. She doesn't want to comfort me. In fact, it seems like she's doesn't even like she's becoming unattract, unattracted to me. So, and I'm like, nobody's ever told me this. Nobody ever, I've never heard of any conversation around this in the church. We're just like, no, you make the covenant and it doesn't matter what happens after that because you're, you're going to be together for life. Absolutely. But man, it's really important that we understand how each other's attraction mechanisms work because we want to, we want to have, be enjoying our, our marriages. We want to be helping our, our spouse um, in, in her level of attraction towards us. And so what this has caused me to wonder, and I'm curious, any reactions you guys have to, to any of this would be interesting. But I, part of what I, I began to wonder is if, we, if this was better known, then don't men need to support other men? Shouldn't fathers support other fathers? Um, you know, if, if, if I don't expect you to go home and get all this, like if you're unemployed again, <laughs> like I, I have, I love helping guys that are struggling. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not, you know, nothing about that is, is being determined by my, by attractiveness, right? I, I'm heterosexual. I could care less. I want you to succeed and I want your family to succeed. And so if I think that you're actually um, making progress, then I've got a lot of energy to coach you and to encourage you. Um, and I, I wonder if in the church we did this more. So anyway, um, so there's really two topics there I want to tease out with you guys. One, do you believe this is true, that there's an attraction mechanism within women that is, that is driven by competence and problem solving? And that, and that because of that, when you're in a marriage and you're struggling with with some of those basic elements of provision or whatever, you're going to like, there's a warning bell that needs to go off. My wife might start losing attraction, attractiveness towards me. I don't know how to say that properly, but she might not be as attracted to me during that season, <laughs> which is like shocking to me because you, you, you feel like you need it then more than ever. Like if there's ever a time I needed my wife to support me, it's when I'm unemployed for two months trying to like figure out something. And uh, you know, but, but Hey, I, there's another mechanism at play you should probably be aware of. And then, and then how do, how do men, especially in the church, how do we as, as fellow fathers support each other? So Blake, I'll start with you and then, yeah, we'll, we'll go, go around the horn, hit Riley and then Tyler, but Blake, yeah, what does it start for you? Yeah, I think it, it resonates. Absolutely. I think it's probably true in the same way that uh, both men and women find uh, a healthy partner to be attractive, right? There are yeah. certain ratios, physical ratios of shoulder to waist for men. Um, or, you know, hip ratio or whatever else for, else for women that is fundamentally attractive and like that is that's scientifically supported and that is information that's helpful to know. And it actually, for me, that's a motivator, right? Like I want to work out. Partially, part of the reason I want to work out is because I want to be attractive to my wife, right? Um, and I think that that's a, that's a solid motivator. Um, and similarly, I think my wife wants to work out because she wants to be attractive to me. Um, now, Am I going to leave her if she doesn't have that ratio or is she going to leave me because I don't have that ratio? No, we are in a uh, covenant before God, 
right? And so there's a certain level of safety, which is actually really important, especially when we're feeling down, if we have a failure in our career or something like that, that there is actually a fundamental level of safety, which is that no one's leaving anybody here. And we, we committed specifically through sickness and health, through richer or for poorer, right? And so <laughs> right. that means, oh, shoot, like we're in this thing together. And there's a nice kind of carrot dangling in front of me, which is like, if I can get back on top of the horse, my wife is going to think I'm attractive. And that's a thing that I like, <laughs> right? And so I think that that's like, yeah. I, I think that the better way to think of it is in terms of incentive as opposed to yes. on the flip side, which is like shame when it's out. I think the covenant exists for when we're knocked down and the carrot exists for, you know, when, when we're trying to set our eyes forward. Mm. Um, and in terms of actually helping each other on the career side, 100%. For, from my standpoint, I need more positive self-talk at home. So like, I don't actually want to get deep into my issues around my work, into my frustrations around my work at night. Uh, or in talking with my wife, I actually want to be like, no, this is what I'm thinking. And I got a plan in place and I just got to trust the plan and I'm going to keep on doing that. And so I think that uh, in general, men, when we talk about our problems, tend to spend like 30 seconds on the problem and like five hours on the solution. And I think that that's actually the dynamic you kind of need to help each other uh, get out of a rut or whatever else if we need to get back to competence. Yes, uh, that's really good. Yeah, Riley, what about you? All right. I'm going to try to make it through my thoughts here. I wrote some down. Well, I have a lot stirring in my head, but um, first I'll say that I think the guy in the video that like he's saying a lot of truth, but I think he's like the stereotypical red pill, right. you know, where it's, it's not healthy patriarchy. He seems to have some negative views, like call women selfish and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I definitely think hypergamy is a real thing. Hypergamy being the idea that women are attracted to equal or higher class, um, you know, how, how we want to look at that, um, where that doesn't typically play a role for, for men um, as much. We're more visually attracted to physical attribute as far as um, in, in the beginning, you know, on the surface level of attraction. Um, but I think what he's getting at here goes... Um, like you say, it goes deeper than what he's saying. I think it gets to the idea of vision. I know you talk about this a lot. Um, it gets to the idea of, of biblical patriarchy, the idea of father rule. And how do you rule if you don't have vision? And if a man is, is not casting vision, like the whole idea of leadership is to chart a course, look at something far from the distance, have a plan of, of how you think you can get there and then gather the team on board and, and, and not just force them to go with, you, but sell them on the idea, get them excited about what you're doing and then go face the challenges to get where you're going. And I think that. Are you following us on Facebook and Instagram yet? Look up at family teams to get even more free content and never miss out on event announcements. I'm saying when, when a, when a husband and a father is doing that and, um, it doesn't matter as much I, from my experience, even just talking to my wife, it doesn't matter as much of how, how much you're providing financially or how, how tight the budget is. If you are actively working heartily towards a vision that you have garnered or gathered your, your family around, and you can have a lull period where you are unemployed and things are tight and you're struggling financially and typically like i have not seen people lose like wives lose attractiveness towards their husband if their husband is actively pursuing the vision in the midst of a challenge yeah. what happens though is when men enter those those faith groups they haven't cast a vision then they don't know where they're going the family doesn't know where they're going the wife feels un insecure unstable mm. confused and lost and then, um, then they start having those doubts of like, can he provide? Has he given up? Do I no longer have a leader? Uh, mm. And then the last thing I'll say to the point of men supporting other men is that uh, I've gone through the season of like complaining to my wife about stuff I'm dealing with. And I actually kind of agree with some of the red hill side of things. But that's not really healthy. Um, you know, there's a, there's a level or you need, you know, making sure that you're being vulnerable with your wife so that she knows what's going on with you and isn't completely lost. But I think two aspects for one, like 
like you were saying, it plays into the idea of, of her insecurity. When you're insecure, she's insecure. And then number two is a woman's maternal instinct to nurture is no good for a man who's struggling. Men do not need to be nurtured and coddled in the midst of struggle. We need to be understood and then encouraged and pushed out, out of whatever rut. Because nine times out of ten, when we're going through a struggle, a large portion of it is probably due to a character flaw that we're dealing with, whether that's lack of focus, undisciplined, whatever that is. And so it takes another man to look through the situation, understand what they're feeling and say, hey, you know, I'm here with you through it. I love you, brother. Uh, but you need to block all social media on your phone and your computer and get to work during work hours and, and stop watching videos, you know, whatever it is. Um, and women typically aren't going to be the ones to do that. Man. <laughs> yeah, those are good points. I, I A couple of things you said, Riley. So um, first of all, shout out to my mom. So one of the things that one of the things that my mom and I've, I've said this to her during like uh, her birthday Shabbat when we we're kind of thinking about um, different ways in which my mom or dad or uh, has have really impacted me. Um, I don't remember. I must have been like maybe 11 or 12 years old and I was complaining to my mom. My mom just like she stopped me dead in my tracks and said, men don't bellyache. Men deal with it. Like she, she, she had zero nurturing left for me. You know, I, I could see that she, she had, she had that ability and she certainly did that when I was really young, but, but I said, I can't remember exactly what age, but some age she was just like, you got to become a man now. Sorry. You're done. You know, you're <laughs> not going to listen to that anymore. And, uh, it, it like, like to have somebody tell you that men don't complain to women. I was like, it, like it cured me for the rest of my life. Like, I just, I feel like it just snapped something. I, like I needed somebody, I needed that kind of like like cold water in the face moment. Um, so anyway, I, I, I like, I think that that's really important to understand. And then I think what you said, Riley, I think it's also really critical to say, this can't be about comparing to other families or some absolute amount of money that we're trying to chase as men or whatever, who cares? Most women don't care about that. They do care that there's a vision and that there's a, there's a competent leader who's leading us towards the vision. And so that vision could be being very frugal, right? We could be on mission and very poor, but if the sense is, the leader's got this, he's competently leading us towards the vision and he's going to care for us. Then I think that most women are like, heck yeah, I'm on board with that guy. But, but it's really the incompetence, the, Hey, we're going to get there. Oh, we didn't. This constantly, um, really, uh, not meeting up to his own expectations or the, uh, or meeting the, the vision he's casting, um, that, that demonstrates like that, that creates sort of a, a very insecure place. And by the way, um, when we do the motherhood roundups, we might bring this back. I would love to hear a woman's perspective on this <laughs> for a bunch of guys trying to figure this out. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm, 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 if they're willing to talk about it, because this is, I think it's a pretty sensitive conversation, but, um, but yeah, this is a, I love, I love trying to understand, um, yeah, how, like, a, I want to be really proactive in helping fathers um, who are in a season where you're really struggling to provide, where you are struggling to lead your family and set a vision, where do you go to, and I think, you know, what you said, Riley, men don't need to be coddled in that situation. Um, they actually, they need help, but, but coddling and nurturing is not really what's necessary. And I would say that, that the one time my wife enjoys nurturing me, I don't know if that's even a good word, is when I've tried really hard and she can see that it's succeeding, but I'm exhausted. Like, that's the moment where she's like, but you know, I, I'm here for you. I want to like, love you. I, you know, <laughs> like she's maximally attracted and you know, I need her. Like there is something there that I think is a beautiful moment between husband and wife. Um, that I think, uh, where that comes out in a positive way that doesn't, it doesn't stop me from, cause I think what, what in the beginning of the video, the guy was dealing with a, somebody who wanted comfort when he was literally sitting at home depressed all day. <laughs> it's like, that's not the time to get nurturing from your wife. So yeah, Tyler, what's, uh, what, what, what does this start for you? Yeah. I th so this reminds me of, I think an, a dynamic within my marriage that we've, my, my wife, Bree and I've had to navigate over our almost 12 years of marriage and I'll, I'll air my own dirty laundry here. And that is that I, by default can be a, a very passive person. Like when left to myself, I, can be pretty low ambition, low vision, uh, kind of that idea of, of like sloth, not, not taking the right action. I'll do something, but it's, it may not be the right thing. 
it's been this constant thing that has come up, especially in the early years of our marriage, where if I were struggling or if I was just feeling like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing things. But right, I'm, my energy is focused in the wrong place. Like my wife is very compassionate, very loving to that. But after some period of time, if that that prolonged inaction is like very indicative of incompetence, right? Where she like kind of hit the point and she's like, "Hey, you you just got to do something," you know. To your point, Jeremy, where it's like I think it differs significantly in the face of like exhaustion as a result of action towards vision versus exhaustion out of a place of inaction and lack of vision. And so that has been a thing that we've had to navigate, right? Especially now with with raising six young kids, my wife homeschools all of them. If I find myself in a place of of complaining or being frustrated for a prolonged period of time, you know, Bree can hit this point to say, hey, I have to make a thousand decisions a day for all of the kids. I cannot make more decisions for you. Like I need you to step up and take, take this on. And it's again, not in a harsh way or not in like a, a confrontational way, but it's just, you know, kind of that, that voice of like, you need to step up and do something. And very rarely in those times have I felt like, oh, she's not supporting me. It's like, I know she just wants me to move, right? Action creates traction. She wants me to just take some steps. And she's going to be like the wind beneath my wings when I do. Um, but it, the longer I sit there in inaction or in passivity, you know, we, we talk about like the lowering attraction that the guy said in the video, like, man, like those are the times where our, our marriage hits points of like, you know, physical intimacy dwindles because of my passivity. You know, there's a very direct relation to that that I think is very, very true. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be a, as big a thing as being unemployed for an extended period of time or trying to start a new business. I think it can be in the mundane moments of navigating daily life with young kids uh, that you can easily find yourself in that place if you're like, not to Riley's point, feeling envisioned and taking steps towards bringing that vision to reality. Yeah. And well, so the last thing I'm curious on this topic is. I, this really stirs up for me when I'm when I'm talking to young men, especially young men who are about to get married. It makes me really want to tell them, man, you need to find a a a a pathway for work where you are increasing in competence. Like there's some kind of ripple effect that occurs. I remember thinking about this the other day when I was sitting in a doctor's office and I was like sitting on those tiny little cubes and I was like, this dude literally goes from from room to room while people are just waiting for him to like. To use skills that he spent eight, 10 years developing, you know, to solve problem after problem. And I imagine going home after like solving 30 problems, diagnosing, you know, all those people and then coming home every night. And, and the reason why people become doctors and lawyers or, get, you know, or craftsmen or get into a profession where it's like, I'm going to use whatever my skills are. And then I'm just going to like enter into the workplace. I'm going to spend eight hours feeling super competent you know, pro solving problem after problem, people are coming to me and I'm, you know, solving all these problems left and right. And then they come home and you're, 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 you, you're a different kind of man in that house after having felt this high level of competence. Then, you know, the opposite of that is the guy who goes to work and he, he's constantly struggling and he's worried he's gonna get laid off. He's got a boss who's, who doesn't appreciate it. It's like, it's just so hard on a guy. Like you, and again, a lot of this is just trying to understand the way men work and then the ripple effect that has on the family and on your wife. And so, yeah, I, 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 this is just the beginning of a thought. I'm trying to understand like if competence is a, is a critical part of attractiveness, then it seems like one of the things that we need to be really careful about is to make sure that there isn't a period, and Tyler, you mentioned this, like a lot of it does have to do with how long this goes on. Like you, you can only exist for so long in a state in which you feel like just incompetent at work and incompetent at home. Um, and I think that part of uh, what I've been really wrestling with with a lot of dads is they'll feel really competent at work, but then they'll get home and they'll start to feel incompetent at home. And a lot of this, a lot of this podcast is, and a lot of things I write is trying to help men and fathers feel competent at home. Like I want you guys to learn how to do this well. Um, and so, uh, it, but I think that there is a, there is a critical part of the way that you think about your own work that probably does play into the confidence of that competence. Um, 
that these are connected in some way. So yeah, does any any thoughts on that? That that stirs up like the connection between the work and the uh, and coming home. Yeah, I wonder how much Jeremy. Just another like thought, kind of on that same vein. And I know we've talked in the past about dads that are over invested in their work giving themselves to work more wholeheartedly than they are their family. And I wonder how much of that is a result of feeling more competent at work, right? They, they feel more at home, they feel more at peace, they, they know what they're doing. And so they, again, going back to my, my statement about you know, taking the right action versus the wrong action, they, the right action may be to invest more wholeheartedly in their family, but they, they feel incompetent there. They avoid that yeah. by in, by overworking because it's a culturally appropriate way to avoid your family is to, yes. to overwork, you know? Yeah. Riley. Yeah. Um, this is, this is something that I'm super passionate about, um, internally and trying to figure out because man, it feels like a beast of a problem, but, um, I feel like men nowadays in general are just lost in terms of how to think about anything like a frame of reference in which to put these things and uh like like to your point you know i i remember being in the military and one of the main reasons i left the military was because of constantly feeling incompetent not because i, I knew i wasn't incompetent but i was enlisted i was in a position where i was surrounded by officers most of the day and a and you're typically treated as an enlisted member just by nature of rank, you ask them. You know, you're like, your opinions don't have as much weight. You're, you're, everything you say or do is doubted in its competency. And, um, and I just got fed up with it. And so after 10 years of service, I left. That was one of the driving, it wasn't the only one, but it was one of the driving reasons. Is I, I was just like, I know that I'm competent and I'm tired of feeling incompetent because it does bleed into your household. You know, you doubt your own decisions at home. You're more insecure just by nature, how you've been for the majority of the day. Um, I think that's huge. And then I think that um, men need more training on how to be competent in the home because we've been trained in the past few decades that the home is the domain of the wife. And I actually disagree. I think the, the, do the home is a d the domain of the husband because the husband, the father is the one who is responsible for the entire household. And, and you have to learn how to, and even have the framework of delegation, you know, of, of how do, how do I assign this responsibility to my wife and then manage that responsibility that I've assigned uh, in a way that's competent. Right. Yeah. So much of that transition, I think is, is the difference between a family and a household. So the way that the culture thinks about it is a, a family is just a place where nurturing happens for young children. And in that environment, women are way more competent to do that. They're just innately built for it um, biologically. But if, if the household is this larger organization that has economic engine in it, that, that has like, you know, older and younger uh, people, aging parents, like there's lots of things have, happening, a whole spiritual life. And all of this requires leadership and all this requires vision. And, and all of this is the primary way that both you and your wife are living your life through this thing called the household. Then yeah, the, the, the structure is completely different. And that's really the biblical structure of the household. It's assuming a household. It's not assuming this strange uh, Frankenstein that we've created in the, in the West uh, that we call the modern family. Um, and so, so much of the confusion just as we don't, we don't really have the proper um, entity in our heads when we're reading scripture and trying to understand where that's coming from.